What's going on guys? Welcome back to Hashtag AskGSM here today, episode 215 for January 10th, 2018. I'm Graham GSM Matthews, where every single Wednesday right here on the show, I answer your questions from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. If you want to send in a question, be sure to tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights. And last but certainly not least, be sure to drop a comment and your question on this very video in the comment section down below i'll include it in next week's edition so without further ado we don't got much to, we don't have too much time here today uh we got three pages worth of questions though a lot of questions an exciting time going on in wwe right now between the 25th anniversary of raw in two weeks we got the royal rumble in three weeks which i'm gonna be at as well and we have the mixed match challenge show coming up next week which we got a few questions about here for today's video so again without further ado let's get started from Emmanuel A. on the YouTube, his question was, Have had you heard about Steve Austin's Extreme Superstar run in ECW before? Essentially the prototype for Stone Cold, even down to health issues. Um, Austin had been contacted by Paul Heyman to record some shoot promos for ECW shortly after Austin was fired by WCW while nursing a tricep injury, as WCW did not see Austin as marketable. Austin would primarily do promos for the brief three months he spent in ECW, including parroting Hulk Hogan as steve mania and Eric Bischoff as an announcer for WCW Monday Nightwell. His only two matches were the match with Mikey Whipwreck at the November to, uh, November to Remember 1995 pay-per-view and a three-way with Mikey and the Sandman at December to Dismember 1995. Um, I knew most of that before watching that November to Remember show. I forgot that he was even on the show quite honestly, until I watched the show about last week and reviewed it for WrestleRant yesterday. Um, I had heard about that. I knew that he was fired from WCW. He had a quick pit stop in ECW, which kind of paved the way for the Stone Cold Steve Austin character that we would later see in WWE. I had heard about that, maybe not the exact details as you had just laid them out to me, but I've seen Stone Cold's documentary before on the one that's on the WWE Network where he talked about all of this. And it's really quite fascinating. I know he just mentioned actually recently, too, on a recent podcast that he did. I'm like, oh, wow, I just watched that match of his from November to Remember. I think he might have been talking to, uh, I know he was talking to, um, what's his name, the hair strutting guy, um, the dude that Hulk Hogan was really good friends with. I completely, his name escapes me at the moment, but I know he was talking to him on a recent podcast, maybe somebody else, but the point being that um, I know he had mentioned it recently, and it was like kind of like triggered my memory as to where all this kind of fell in the timeline. But yeah, you are right. Obviously, he would have that quick stop in ECW with only two matches, which is quite which is quite incredible because his ECW run is not the most memorable. But that entire time, he would primarily be cutting promos, which is quite amazing. Which would kind of help him, you know, obviously hone those skills on the mic. Like, as I had said, kind of setting the stage and planting the seeds for that future Stone Cold Steve Austin character that we would see in WWE a few years down the road. His second question, uh, do you remember how I compared the 2017 SmackDown to 2004 SmackDown? Well, 2003 SmackDown has similarities too, because in watching episodes on the network, I've realized how much Vince McMahon dominated the show that year. Like Shane being on top, uh, being the top face for SmackDown Live, Vince was the top heel on SmackDown in 2003, feuding with Hulk Hogan, Zach Gowan, Brock Lesnar, Stephanie, because of course, and The Undertaker. Do you think 2018 will also be McMahon-dominated? I mean, so far from what we've seen, we're only 10 days into the new year, of course, but from what we've seen on SmackDown and the two episodes that have aired up to this point, it seems like it will be, unfortunately, and I love Shane. He's probably the most tolerable McMahon currently in WWE. But that being said, he... Daniel Bryan, who I also love, have been just shoved down her throat to this whole authority angle. Basically, anything we saw on Raw in like late 2016 with Stephanie and Mick and that whole nonsense, we're seeing play out again in 2018, which is such a waste because the real appeal of SmackDown for a long time there in the latter half of 2016 and even early on in 2017 was the fact that it was not focused on the authority figures. Shane and Bryan kind of played... Um, you know, kind of had a curtailed role on the show. I mean, obviously Shane was feeding with AJ Styles at a few points leading into WrestleMania, but even that feed was great. What we're seeing right now play out with Shane and Brian is not intriguing at all. The only real payoff that makes sense to any of this is if Brian wrestles. But as I've talked about many times before, I just don't think that's the end game. It should be, but I feel like if they were going to let him wrestle, 
they would have let him wrestle by now. Um, and maybe they're, I mean, this is WWE. Anything can change. They wanted to let him wrestle just to ensure that he does not go to another company because he's talked a lot about that, of course, on social media and various interviews. The guy does not give a shit. Um, so if they want to ensure that he doesn't leave and they want to have him wrestle in the company, you know what? That's fine. I'm, I'm in full favor of that. But I feel like if they were going to let him wrestle, um, and it's not a matter of whether they let him or they don't. I mean, it kind of sort of is, but there's a lot of pressure from the Joseph Maroons of the world and people like that who diagnosed him with a concussion in the first place, it was more so their decision than the company's to not let him wrestle. So if they kind of go back on that, what kind of message that does that send? Like, that's my question. Um, but to get back to your question, um, will SmackDown be authority figure dominated, or McMahon dominated, rather, in 2018? So far, unfortunately, that appears to be the case. Hopefully we kind of... Uh, the the Shane and Brian angle kind of dies down as 2018 progresses. His next question, I forgot to mention this last week, but I bought the New Japan Pro Wrestling World subscription <clears throat> recently for Wrestle Kingdom 12. I even watched the whole show live, which I should have known was a bad idea at 2 a.m., but I did it anyway. What is the latest that you've ever stayed up for an event? Um, I didn't stay up to watch that. That was crazy late, crazy early, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Like you said, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. was when it started, and the show was like six hours long, so people were watching Wrestle Kingdom up until like 9, 10 a.m., which is great. It was an awesome show. I just had no interest. I value my sleep, so I really had no interest in that at all. But um, that being said, uh, the latest I've ever stayed up for a pay-per-view or like an event. I mean, really, most events don't run that late anyway, so, like, nothing really comes to mind, the only event that comes to mind that I probably stayed up late for was, uh, WrestleMania 33 and being there live, uh, the show didn't get over until well after midnight, which was ridiculous for, like, a six or seven hour show for WrestleMania, um, that show ran long, WrestleMania 32 also ran long, 33 ran longer, like, I remember looking at my phone and seeing that it was, like, 12.15 at night, um, when Undertaker was still, like, doing his whole shtick, and he was, like, getting ready to go. Like, it was super, super late. And we didn't get back to the hotel until, like, 1.30, because it took a while with all the traffic and whatever, so... Yeah, that was that was a long night, so I would probably say that was the, uh... the longest I've ever had to stay up for a show. And also the Ring of Honor pay-per-views, too. The All-Star Extravaganza show that I went to, and also, um... The final battle pay-per-view I went to last month, they both ended around midnight, which is late, but not as late as WrestleMania 33. That was a, that was a long night. Um, anyway, his next question, or not his next question, Lane of the Wise next question. Are the Cruiserweights cursed? You know what? It would appear so. And I was thinking about that last night when it appeared that Cedric Alexander had gotten injured in that match with Tony Nese on 205 Live. Um, thankfully, that was not the case, but it struck me right then and there, and I probably should have realized this sooner, that the Cruiserweights are seemingly cursed, uh, with everyone getting hurt. I mean, Hideo Itami, his his run so far has been decent, but he's not getting over. I mean, are really any of the Cruiserweights over except for maybe Enzo? I would argue no, but that's just me. Um, you know, Brian Kendrick got hurt. Noam Dar got hurt. I know that someone else got hurt. TJP was out for a while, too. Rich Swan got suspended. Um, like, as they begin to tour for 205 Live... It's not looking too good. Neville's gone. Like, he kind of walked out in the company said, screw this. So he's not going to be around for the 205 Live Tour either. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people that will not be on that tour. <laughs> the two people that will be on the tour is going to be Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy. So they, they knew that the ticket sales were going to bomb, so they put those two guys on. They're not like that's really going to do much good. Uh, they've already canceled one of their live events for the 205 Live Tour later on this month. So obviously not a good reflection of the ticket sales, which is not surprising in the slightest. But, uh, yeah, I would argue that the Cruiserweights are cursed um, or just that they're booked badly. Either one I would make a uh, strong case for, absolutely. Brandon A. from YouTube, his question was, I want Shinsuke Nakamura to win this year's Royal Rumble, as do many other fans. There is one big problem with that, though, if WWE goes with that plan. How do you book him in a feud with AJ for 10-plus weeks without having him being able, without him being able to speak English well? Furthermore, if you actually put the belt on him at WrestleMania and give him a title run, let's say for about three months, now you need to book him in main event segments for another 12 weeks worth of TV. Do you see why WWE would be hesitant to give us Nakamura as champ because of this? I don't think doing things the same way they did in NXT would work because you could really because you could rely on a smarky full sale crowd and he didn't have to appear on every show. 
You can make the argument to not put him on every show, but we wouldn't let WWE get away with AJ Styles, Kevin Owens, or another fan favorite as champ not being on every show. Uh, plus, he is a full-timer, unlike Brock Lesnar, who was a part-timer. As much as they want AJ Nakamura at Mania, I don't trust them to be able to write story for Nakamura as challenger and then champion for over five months' worth of TV shows. I completely agree. That, to me, is probably why... Not only why they didn't put the championship on Nakamura um, during that feud with Jinder Mahal, but then again, the whole feud was terrible. I mean, it kind of goes both ways, too. Jinder was always not going to be a good fit as champion. Nakamura, throughout that entire feud, really did nothing to impress anyone to convince us that he's the main event player. We know he is. I know he is. You know he is. A lot of people know he is. Um, but I think he was given the chance in that feud with Jinder to really prove that he's a top-tier talent. And not to say they don't still view him that way, like he was involved in a big match at Clash of Champions, and he's still very much over. Maybe not as over as he was, you know, at this time a year ago or when he first got called up to the main roster, whatever. Um, but during that feud with Jinder, he did nothing on the mic or in the ring to really prove to people that he belongs at that level with the AJ Styleses and the Randy Ortons. And obviously, Jinder didn't belong in that level either to begin with. But any promo that he cut during that feed was really not that good. Again, like you said, he does not speak English well. That's not to say that they should, you know, scrap his main event push altogether. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, I'm just arguing that with when it comes to Shinsuke Nakamura, that they should probably just either limit his promos altogether. You can't have him not speak. Um, giving him a mouthpiece would be great, but I don't know. I feel like the dialogue that they gave him during the course of that feud was just not good. Like, I mean, he wasn't a great mic worker or an NXT, but at the same time, it's like they weren't having him speak every week, like you said. And also when they did, it was either in backstage segments, like in pre-taped stuff, like interviews and stuff with like Renee Young or whoever, or they were just not having him do much talking at all. Like when he had challenged Finn Balor on that episode of NXT, like about year and a half ago, two years at this point, he only really just came out, like, pointed at Finn Balor and said, I want you in a match or something. That was it. They didn't do anything else. They did nothing else but have him say just that in the build-up to that match. Like, obviously, you need to have him do more talking than that, especially if he's world champion. Uh, but, you know, he was the top face on NXT for a really, really long time. And when the promos that he cut, he wasn't, you know, doing long-winded promos. He just can't do that. He's just not capable of that. Like, it's like you said, the English is just not good. But what makes it worse is the dialogue they're giving him to work with in these promos on the main roster. It's just atrocious. It's terrible. So I, don't, I, I would say, like, don't give him as bad promos, but you know that's not going to happen with this company because a lot of the promos they give these guys to work with just see them sink every single time. They just allow them to just... It's pretty much just setting them up to fail because these promos are terrible. I was playing the 2K18 video game the other day and it's like the promo sound, every bit is corporate. Every bit is you know, phony or false in the video game as they do in real life. It's amazing to me. Um, okay, but again, going back to your question, though, is that a reason to not do the match at WrestleMania? I would say no. You are right. It is a big problem, but there are ways to work around it without having him not appear on TV. Again, you can have the other person do the talking for him or um, just not give him as many, you know, uh, things to work with in the dialogue and whatever. Like AJ Styles, he's come a long way on the mic in the last... I would argue five or six years, um, especially since coming to WWE, uh, since coming to WWE. But at the same time, um, even the promo that he was given to work with last night on SmackDown was not good. The guy was fumbling all over the place. He couldn't remember his lines. Like if AJ Styles can't remember his lines, can really Nakamura do the same when he can't speak English all that well? Like again, so I, I absolutely can see why they're hesitant to give Nakamura a main event push or put him back in that spot that he had occupied for a brief time. In, uh, you know, late on in 2017 during that feud with Jinder. But still, the guy is really, really good. Nakamura AJ is the match they should do at WrestleMania for the WWE Championship. There are ways to work around it. I know he's not the greatest mic worker in the world, and you can barely understand him, but that's why you put people with him. I think a, I think a mouthpiece would be great. I don't know who it would be. Paul Heyman's currently busy on Raw with Lesnar, so I'm not sure who it would be. Um, but in the meantime, there are ways to work around it without scrapping the match entirely, in my opinion. Favorite home cooked meal? Uh, chicken cutlets. That's easy. Mark asks from Facebook, do you think a female referee would be a good idea for the Women's Royal Rumble match? Maybe the female who refereed about recently in NXT. Uh, that was the same woman, I think, who refereed all the matches, or most of the matches anyway, for the Mae Young Classic last year. 
I completely forgot about that. You were absolutely right. That'd be a great idea. Um, I mean, they don't really, I mean, obviously they have the referees not in the ring, but around the ring. It would be cool if they brought in a woman referee for that match. I don't think we've seen that woman yet referee match on the main roster. I think so far she's been exclusive to NXT. But yeah, it would be cool if you're going to bring up, you know, women from NXT to be in the Rumble, which we'll talk about a little later on. Um, I think it'd also be cool if you brought her in as one of the referees at ringside. I think it'd add a nice little touch to the first ever women's Royal Rumble match. Next question. Uh, what do you think of this as a future feud? The original Shield versus the Samoan Shield, Samoa Joe and the Usos. That sounds awesome. Um, I know there was an idea being tossed around, not like legitimately, but by like fans. It was a uh, fantasy booking scenario where it was Roman Reigns and um, I think not not Roman Reigns. Sorry, Samoa Joe and the Authors of Pain versus the Shield. Now. I like that a lot too. Joe and the Usos kind of makes more sense because the Usos already have that built-in history with um, with Roman Reigns. They're already kind of getting over as baby faces anyway, so it might be it might not even really matter. And Dean Ambrose won't be around for a number of months apparently, which kind of sort of sucks. Um, but let's say it was possible. Let's say the Usos were full-fledged heels. They were in the process of being turned baby face, and that's just my pure speculation. And Dean Ambrose was around. That would be a pretty sweet trio. I mean, I know we've had re- we have recently had like Samoa Joe in the bar, uh, taking on the Shield, which was really really good. They had some good matches on TV, but I think Joe and the Usos would be an even better tandem um, against you know familiar foes and Roman Reigns and Rollins and Ambrose. His next question: Which women from NXT, speaking of which, could you see in the Women's Royal Rumble, and should Stephanie McMahon enter it? No, she should not, but I expect her to. I know people have said that she'll be. The last one standing in there with like a Ronda Rousey or something. You know what? As long as she doesn't win. But even that, you know, she shouldn't be in it. It should be all about the current women's roster. If they really want to play up this women's revolution, evolution, whatever the hell they want to call it. If they really want to play that up as like the next big thing. And the women are taking steps to being on the same men, uh, being on the same level as the men. They can't have Stephanie in there. You just can't. It's all, why is all always have to be all about the McMahons? It shouldn't be. She was the one who announced the match in the first place. So putting her in there just makes no sense. Um, I know it would kind of make sort of sense from a storyline standpoint, but in the kind of sense, in the kind of way where it doesn't make sense, where having her overshadow the likes of the Oscars of the world and, you know, Becky's and whoever else, it's just a waste. Why should you put all those women in there from not only the present, but the past two and have Stephanie McMahon be the one to stand tall? Maybe not win it, but you know if she's in it. She'd probably be in there till the end, which is just ridiculous and because she never gets her comeuppance. But anyway, I'm going to say no on that. I think she probably will. I don't think she should, but she probably will. Um, What woman from NXT should be in the Women's Rumble? Again, like I said, I probably, I think I talked about this a few weeks ago, but um, Ember Moon, I think would be a shoo-in. She's the NXT Women's Champion. She might not be after TakeOver that Saturday, but I think Ember Moon would be a great pick. Peyton Royce and Billy Kay, I almost expect... Or one of them, at least. At least Peyton Royce to be in the Women's Rumble. Because there's, like, nothing left for them to do. I think Peyton could follow in the footsteps of her real-life boyfriend, Ty Dillinger, and kind of appear in the Women's Rumble before not being officially called up until after, like, WrestleMania. That'd be pretty cool. But I almost expect, like, I'm like I, I'm fully expecting one of those women, at least Peyton Royce, to be in the Women's Royal Rumble. Because there's nothing left for them to do in NXT. Nikki Cross would be cool. It seems like Sanity might be... um you know, uh, earmarked for the ear ro- for the main roster at some point in the very near future. I know they just lost the NXT Tag Team titles to Undisputed Era, so I could see them being called up with Nikki Cross as part of the women's division at some point in the very near future, maybe even after WrestleMania. Um, Shayna Baszler, I'll throw in there too. I know she just showed up in NXT, so the chances of it happening aren't really all that high. I wouldn't put her in there, um, especially if she's not going to win, and she shouldn't win. Um, but I could see it happening, especially if they want to get Ronda in there. Maybe they do a face-off or they team up against the other women. Like, I don't know. I guess they, they could play around with the idea. Um, but Shayna Baszler, I expect to be a part of that TakeOver weekend, whether it be with TakeOver or the Women's Rumble. I expect her to appear at one or the other because they just brought her in. They're giving her a lot of, uh, you know, momentum between uh, the attacks that she's done and stuff like that. So I would not be surprised to see her at some point that weekend, maybe on both shows. We'll see. Uh, But those are my top picks to appear in the Women's Rumble, though, from NXT. Next question. Do you think Carmella could do with someone by her side like Tamina to make her title run more interesting if she successfully cashes in her Money in the Bank 
uh, briefcase or contract, whatever? Or would she be okay on her own? I mean, they had that with James Ellsworth. I thought they made for a fine act. Um, James Ellsworth, I was never really the biggest fan of in the first place. There was really only so much they could do, and I think Carmella is perfectly fine on her own at this point. So when they released Ellsworth, I wasn't heartbroken over it because I think Carmella can be a fine heel on her own. Um, but pairing her off with, like, a Tamina, no thanks. Like, we've seen Tamina in the bodyguard role, like, a million times. She's already doing that for Lana. Putting her with, uh, Carmella just, to me, would be a waste. I think she's over enough on her own where she doesn't need someone to work off of. Um, I think putting her with Big Cass at some point would be really, really cool. If they reunite Carmella, Big Cass, and Enzo at some point down the road as heels, that would be pretty sweet. Um, but in, in terms of putting, like, Tamina with her, that doesn't really interest me at all. Uh, their next question, Mark's next question. What would you think of the idea of putting different covers on Elias's guitar every time he appears on Raw just for entertainment purposes? Interesting or not interesting? Uh, I don't really care either way, to be honest with you. I mean, I guess that would work uh, just to kind of switch it up, but I really have no preference either way. At Reborn again from Twitter, uh, what are your top five or what are your three to five favorite least and least favorite Royal Rumble matches and why? So, my three to five favorite and three to five least favorite Royal Rumble matches. Um, let's see. So I know I've talked about this before. I know I did a random video blog on my favorite Rumble matches a few years ago. Um, there is one slight change um, in that I would add the 2016 Rumble on there because I really, really enjoyed that Rumble. It might be my favorite Rumble to date, the ones that I've been a fan for. <clears throat> I really thought that Rumble was great from... I mean, Triple H winning wasn't amazing, but the way that it was done with Dean Ambrose lasting until the very end and AJ Styles making his debut and Sami Zayn showing up, I thought that Rumble was excellent. Um, so 2016 would be among my favorites easily. 2008, I was not yet a fan for yet, but I watched back that Rumble. That whole show was awesome. Um, but that Rumble match, I really enjoyed with Cena coming back and the other the other, the other little surprises with, um, you know, like the Mick Foley's and the Jimmy Snuka's. I mean, Mick Foley, I think, was already planned to be in it. But, uh, you know, Jimmy Snuka and Roddy Piper showing up. Um, as I've talked about before, I just watched the back last night, the 2010 Royal Rumble match. I love a lot. I thought they told a lot of good stories in there with Shawn Michaels and John Cena and Triple H and Batista and Edge coming back and a lot of other little things with the legacy <clears throat> and especially CM Punk. I love that Rumble, so that would easily be among my favorites as well. The 2011 Rumble doesn't really stand the test of time. I don't think people thought it was a great Rumble at the time. And I don't think it's all that great in retrospect, but I still really do enjoy it for, like, nostalgic purposes. Um, that would be among my favorite, not no longer, like, the number one my favorite Rumble ever, but it's up there, um, at least on the list. And other favorite Rumbles that I wasn't a fan for, but I've watched on the network, like, the 92 Rumble's obviously great. There's a bunch of other really, really good Rumbles, but I don't really remember them too well, or I haven't seen them in a while. The 2005 Rumble, I remember liking quite a bit. Um, again, a lot of cool up-and-comers, and they had a great Final Four with Edge, Rey Mysterio, John Cena, Batista, all four future world champions, and other, a lot of little cool things along the way. Um, so I enjoyed that 05 Rumble a lot. For these favorite Rumbles, the 2012 Rumble I thought was abysmal. I remember hating that at the time. I do not like it in retrospect, you know, watching it back for the few times that I have. Just a lot of wasted spots. They saved all the big stars for the end. There was a lot of people that weren't in it. Like, um, I remember hoping that Christian was going to be in it. He wasn't. Kane wasn't in it for, for some reason. John Cena didn't show up as I expected him to. Um, there were a lot of people that just did not show up. Like, a big show was in a world title match earlier on in the evening, yet he was in the Rumble for whatever reason. I have no idea why. But yeah, I did not like that 2012 Rumble. There were there were a few cool surprises, you know, with Karma and Road Dog and a few others, but that Rumble did not interest me at all. Uh, obviously, the 2014 and 2015 Rumbles were just shit. I thought even, you know, excluding the outcome, those Rumbles were just completely lifeless for the most part. The 2015 Rumble was off to a good start with, like, Bubba Ray and DDP and the Boogeyman. But after Brian got eliminated, like, a third throw, it was all downhill from there. So that Rumble is... Easily one of the worst ever, and among my least favorite, and the 2014 Rumble. And other Rumbles that I did not, you know, I wasn't a fan for, but I've seen back on the network, probably the 99 Rumble, because McMahon was in there, and it was all about Stone Cold and McMahon, again, which I know was like the top few to 99 for WWE, but we had seen that already a million times, no one else was really allowed to shine, 
Um, and I've talked about 99 before and being one of my least favorite years in WWE just because of all like the, I don't know, I'm just not a big Attitude Era fan. And I just thought there was a lot of filler and a lot of just garbage in that match. So least favorite, 2012, 2014, 2015, and 99. Favorite, 2016, 08, 2010, 2011, and 05. His next question, if John Cena versus Samoa Joe at WrestleMania 34 does happen, could we see a submission victory for Samoa Joe on the grandest stage of them all? I doubt it. I would be shocked. I would honestly be shocked, which is would be great if they did it. Don't get me wrong. I do not expect it at all, though. Um, if John Cena hasn't tapped out by now, he's probably never going to tap out unless he goes heel, which is, again, another thing that will likely never happen. So, no, that's not going to happen. They could do a deal where they did, you know, with what they did with Rusev at Fastlane 2015, where he's got him in the Kohina clutch and he doesn't tap out. That was technically a submission victory for uh, for Rusev that night, which was huge. And then he went on to lose a fucking WrestleMania to John Cena. But anyway, it was, a, you know, a good feud. Uh, with Cena and Joe, first of all, they should do it at WrestleMania. Second of all, Joe's got to win. And I think he needs to win way more than John Cena does at this point. John Cena... I mean, he suffered a few TV losses here and there to guys like Shinsuke Nakamura and to Roman Reigns, but the guy hasn't lost at a WrestleMania since WrestleMania 28. That was six years ago. He beat The Rock. He beat Bray Wyatt. He beat Rusev. He didn't wrestle at 32. He was there. He pretty much buried the Wyatt family, and um, then he won last year against, uh, who was it? The Miz and Maurice with Nikki Bella, so... I think he is owed a loss at some point in the very near future, and it might as well be to Joe at WrestleMania 34. Next question, also from at Reborn again. Do you think uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling could make a major dent in the United States as it stands right now, or do they need a couple more American stars on their roster? I think they will, and I think they kind of already have. I mean, they made a pretty decent dent in the U.S. Like, not that they'll ever be direct competition to WWE in the United States, they kind of are the WWE equivalent in New Japan. In in Japan, there's no question about that in terms of how big it is and whatever to that country. Um, but yeah, with the U.S., I mean, they did a number of shows here, like last summer, and I think they already have a few slated for like their Long Beach shows or something like that, like in March maybe. Um, so yeah, I think they've already made a pretty decent dent in the U.S. Again, not that they'll ever be competition for WWE, but I just think they need to run more shows. Like, doing three shows a year is not going to cut it for New Japan in the United States. Um, but they already have plenty of buzz from, obviously, their New Japan work and whatever being over there. And bringing that over here to the United States and doing the right markets, I think, would be huge for them. It already has been huge for them, but I think doing more shows more consistently will only better their chances of being, you know, a legitimate company in the United States. At Agent Red Raider from Twitter, going to Raw in San Antonio this week. I have not been following closely. Can you give me what to expect? Honestly, I think Raw might be the better show to attend than SmackDown nowadays. I honestly have been enjoying Raw much more than I have in SmackDown. Okay, maybe not much more, but um, I think Raw has been pretty bearable for the most part in the last few weeks. First of all, the first thing to expect is that it's going to be a long night. The show is three hours. They usually have a dark match. They have a pre-match, a dark match before the show. So it's going to be a long night. The show is already three hours as it is. Depending on what time you arrive, it could be close to four hours. People get restless. People leave. I've seen it before. I've been to a number of Raws. So just be prepared for a long night of wrestling. Um, but I always enjoy it. I mean, it's personal It's personal preference with Raws versus like the house shows. Like, do you enjoy the televised shows more? Because more stuff is bound to happen. Or like the house shows have more of a like a better environment where they interact with the audience and they can kind of get away with more stuff. The Raws, you never really know what you're going to get, and if they're going to be good matches or not. The house shows are usually some really, really good wrestling, although they're a bit predictable, obviously. Um, so I think it's going to be a good show, especially I think you're going to Raw around you know the perfect time with Royal Rumble coming up and with the 25th anniversary of Raw coming up and WrestleMania season upon us. I think going to Raw maybe three or four months ago might not have been the best decision because there's not really a lot going on in the fall. But as we approach the Royal Rumble, it could be a really good show. Um, I thought this week's show was actually pretty decent. A lot better than SmackDown. Nothing happened on SmackDown, like, at all. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do this week in Raw. And if you're going, have a fun time. And expect, um, again, a lot of matches. It's going to be a long night. But if you pay yourself, you go get food and go to the bathroom at the right times. It should be an enjoyable experience. At RJ underscore Marceau, my brother Mr. Marceau, his question was, who will have a more successful main roster run, Sonya Deville or Liv Morgan? 
I got to go with DeVille. I mean, I've you know, RG's not going to like my answer, and I know he's not going to like my answer because he told me recently that he's a big Liv Morgan fan now, apparently. But he used to be, then he was, and now he is again. It's 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 an on and off again thing. It's really weird. But um, I don't know. She's just done nothing to impress me at all. She's got good banter on Twitter, but that's about it. Like, in the ring, she's not good. Um, she looked like a 12-year-old girl on SmackDown wearing her mom's makeup. Like, she didn't have a good appearance, like, at all this week. I'm not sure about other weeks. I didn't pay close attention, but there was a picture posted from either last week on SmackDown. I thought it was this week, and she looked fucking terrible. Um, but in the ring, she's nothing special. This Riot Squad thing has already kind of been a bust with the amount of, um, losses they've, you know, uh, accumulated over the last number of weeks. So on her own, I don't have much faith that she'll be a top star, like, at all. Um, Sonya Deville, I think they have more invested in because I don't know the, the whole MMA background and everything like that. I think she's better in the ring than Liv Morgan for one thing. She's got a better look. I don't know. I found Sonya Deville to be much more prettier, much prettier than Liv Morgan in my personal opinion. Um, and she's also off to a stronger start with, um, Absolution and Raw as opposed to the Riot Squad on SmackDown. So, Gun to head, I'd say DeVille. I mean, it's really up in the air. I mean, Liv Morgan, they might push her as, like, the next Kelly Kelly, but she's not that good, like, at all. Like, I don't know what people see in her, but to each their own, I guess. But I do think Sonya DeVille will have a more successful main roster run. And a second question, are you excited for the Mixed Match Challenge besides a few teams? I think it'll be very interesting. Honestly, I am, and I, I hate to say that because I hate the fact that we're getting more WWE content, something I know I, I, I'd have never said, like, five or six years ago. But we already have enough. We already have enough content on the network and on Raw and SmackDown and NXT. We already have enough WWE shows. But I will give it to them. This has my interest. Um, like you said, a few teams or whatever. Um, like Apollo Crews, Nia Jax. Who cares? I know it was supposed to be Enzo. And I think Bailey and Samoa Joe would have been a cool team. And now it's Bailey and Elias, which is also kind of interesting too. But I like, you know, Jimmy Uso and Naomi. We're obviously married in real life. So they have that chemistry built in already. You got Rusev and Lana. You got Becky Lynch and Sami Zayn. I think that's a great team, too. Um, you got Bobby Roode and Charlotte, which is a, a great team, a glorious team, even. Um, on Raw, I'm trying to think who else we have. Finn Balor and Sasha Banks. I think it's a really, really good team. Um, I can't remember the other teams right now, but I like them a lot, though. Asuka and The Miz, Goldust and Alicia Fox. There's some good teams in there. I think it's going to be a cool show because we don't really see mixed match, you know, intergender intergender tag team matches anymore in WWE TV. We used to a lot like years ago when the women were like an afterthought in the roster. But ever since they started taking the women more seriously, we don't really see many intergender matches on TV nowadays. So it should be interesting. They've got some good teams. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out. It could be a joke. Like it could be what like the um, that Saturday morning slam was show. Like what that show was many, many years ago. And that it was kind of like lighthearted. I think it was like G-rated too. I don't think it's going to be that bad. Like that toned down. Um, but I am interested though. Which again, I hate to say because I do not like the fact that we're getting more content. They're going to be filming this after SmackDown before 205 Live. Like, oh, sounds atrocious. But um, in terms of the, like the long nights that SmackDown crowds are going to have. But um, overall though, I think it's a cool concept. And I am looking forward to it. At Jamie Lee Mack from the Twitter machine, bringing back the Mac, the hashtag asked GSM. His question was, what would you rather watch a marathon of, 205 Live or WWE Storytime? And no, death is not an option. Honestly, I don't know what the hate is here for uh, for Storytime. I like Storytime. It's not the best show on the network, but I think it's a good show. Um, I don't know. There were a few episodes I really laughed at, like with Jonathan Coachman. I think he's a great storyteller. And there were a few other episodes I thought were good. I mean... Granted, they kind of take stories from other, like, DVD projects and they rehash them on the show. But that aside, I think it's a cool little forum. And I think, I don't know, I found it to be funny. So I like Storytime. 205 Live is just dull as all hell. So this, to me, is a no-brainer. Storytime, absolutely a marathon of that over 205 Live. At Jeremy8911 from Twitter, his question was, When Elias introduced Miz, was I the only one for a second that thought Bo and Curtis were going to turn on the Miz and walk with Elias? I didn't think it was going to happen right then and there, but you do got a good point, though, where I think they could be going in that direction. I mean, after all, Elias has been kind of closely associated with the Miz Taraj in Miz's absence. Like, I don't know if they have, you know, uh, Bo and Curtis turn on Miz, and Miz goes babyface. I mean, a Miz Elias feud could be interesting, but um, I think the end game is getting Miz away from 
uh, Bo and Curtis. If Miz is going to be a babyface, which I think he could do well out, although he is a better heel, he'd have to be by himself uh, without Maurice, too. And Maurice is currently pregnant, so obviously she's not going to be on TV anyway. Um, but also, too, if they move Miz back to SmackDown, which they absolutely should do at some point, whether it be before WrestleMania, after WrestleMania, they got to do that soon at any point, at some point anyway. So if you do that, you might as well just have the Miz Taraj not break up because Bo and Curtis have you know seen a career resurgence as a result of the Miz Taraj group. Just put them with Elias, you know. So I do like that idea a lot. I don't know if they'll turn on Miz or it's just going to be a soft split at some point. But I do them. I do see them going in that direction at some point in the very near future. Whether it be again before Mania, after Mania, I don't know. But sooner rather than later, I do expect them to do that split uh, with Miz and the Miz Taraj. <clears throat> and his second question, is it just me or is WWE pretty much the only company that has a problem with people getting over organically, at least on the main roster? Yeah, I mean, they hate the fact when people get themselves over, you know, on their own and it wasn't, you know, their creation or whatever. It has to be because of WWE that people get over in their eyes. I mean, obviously, Daniel Bryan was a different issue and that was just way too overwhelming to ignore. But if they're not your guy, then they're not going to push you. More often than not, anyway. And obviously, you know, that's been an issue recently with Rusev. And I'm hoping, I mean, again, maybe just false hope. I am hoping that these losses that Rusev and English are, you know, stacking up are leading somewhere. Maybe a Rusev babyface turn and he turns on English. I think the two were a good, you know, duo together, so I wouldn't do that. But I would have Rusev go babyface either way, because the guy is getting over. The more over he's, the most over he's ever been in his entire career. So why would you ignore that? Why would you just go back to having him be a heel and lose every week? I mean, they hate the fact when people get over organically. Look no further than Zack Ryder. The guy got himself a U.S. Championship run out of it. What for like a month before they took the belt off him and uh, you know just made him a loser again? <laughs> so yeah, they hate the fact that people get over organically. And WWE is just very petty in that respect, um, at least in my opinion, when it comes to. People getting over by themselves, which they have apparently encouraged. Like, Vince McMahon was all about that on the Stone Cold Podcast. You know, people have no balls. They don't want to get over on themselves, whatever. They're just way too scared, whatever. And then they get themselves over, and then they get de-pushed. So, like, it's mixed signals. Mixed messages. Um, so, yeah, it seems like WWE is, like, the only company I've ever seen, anyway, that has a problem with people getting over on their own and not capitalizing on that. So, again, hopefully that's a different case with Rusev. I don't have faith it will be, but there is a slight chance that these losses are leading somewhere or Rusev. I mean, one can only hope. At Scarlet One from Twitter, let's see here. Which year is more historically significant in WWF slash WWE? Uh, 1997 or 2002? Good question. <sighs> Probably 97. I know 02. Um, obviously, they went from WWF to WWE. And they brought back the brand split. And obviously they had John Cena, Batista, and Brock Lesnar debut. But 97, we saw the rise of Stone Cold Steve Austin with that amazing match with Bret Hart at WrestleMania. The Montreal Screwjob. Really, the Montreal Screwjob in kind of like the early stages of the Attitude Era. The debut of the heel Mr. McMahon character. Both years are very important to the company's history. But I would argue that 97, without 97, 02 doesn't happen. I don't, honestly, I, I fully believe that. Without the success of 1997 and everything that happened that year, 02 would have never even been a possibility because they would have lost the Monday Night War and maybe even gone out of business. So 97 pretty much had to happen. So it is absolutely more historically significant than 2002. For as many things that happened in 02, 97 was more important and significant historically in the company's history, in my opinion. Push 3, repackage to release 1. Braun Strowman, Finn Balor, The Miz, Randy Orton, Shinsuke Nakamura, and AJ Styles. Obviously got to push Styles. I would push Strowman 2 and Nakamura. I would repackage Finn Balor and do a heel with the rest of the Balor club. And repackage Miz into either a babyface or make him more of a main event guy. Because I like the IC thing, you know, the Intercontinental Championship gimmick, whatever. But he should be a main event player, so I would repackage him and release Orton. I mean, the guy's a great wrestler. He's still very much over, but if the guy left tomorrow, I think the roster would be just fine. I think the other people I mentioned have more to offer at this point in time than Randy Orton does. 
I think Strowman is a, a huge star for them. AJ Styles speaks for himself. And I, I still think Nakamura can be a big star for them if they push him the right way. Orton been there, done that like 13 times. So I'd release Orton, repackage Balor and Miz, and push Styles, Strowman, and Nakamura. What was the better show, WWF Survivor Series 1995 or ECW November to remember 1995? I had to look back at the results for Survivor Series 95 because I know I watched it at some point, um, like maybe two or three years ago to review for WrestleRant, but I don't remember it. Uh, looking back, that was a really good show, um, especially with that great main event that blew out everyone's expectations out of the water between Bret Hart and Diesel. But I can't vote against November to remember. Um, I think that was probably one of the best pay-per-views the company ever did. Sabu came back from WCW. Taz went heel. Stone Cold had one of his only ECW matches for the ECW title against Mikey Whipwreck. And you had a really good main event with, I think it was Cactus Jack and Raven against uh, Tommy Dreamer and, God, who was it, Terry Funk? It was a great show. And Rey Mysterio was in action against Psychosis. Really fun match. I gotta go November to remember. I mean, both shows weren't perfect. Survivor Series had its fair share of filler, and November to Remember also had a fair share of filler, but I gotta go with better and more historically significant November to Remember, 95 from ECW. Next question, also from at Scarlet One. Have you heard Samoa Joe is going to voice act in a Transformer cartoon? I have heard that. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm not a Transformers fan at all, but the fact he's got a new project lined up, Hey, I'm all for it. That's pretty sweet. More acting gigs for Joe. The guy's awesome. So why wouldn't you give him more acting gigs? So I think that's great. I mean, it's a it's a you know voice acting thing, but still better than nothing. Joe's awesome. He deserves it. Best and worst episodes of Raw that you can think of, huh? Worst in recent memory. I mean, a lot of people will tell you any Raw from the last like three years, which is not all that far off. I remember the Raw from October of 2011, where John Laurinaitis was named like the new interim raw gm was terrible absolutely terrible um one of the worst raws i can recall from a recent memory the raw from memorial day of 2017 where we had the this is your life segment with bailey and alexa bliss was also atrocious um if only for that segment but that's the only thing people will ever remember from that show so that um Again, a lot of Raws in recent memory have either just been... They're just kind of mad. They're not terrible. They're not amazing. For amazing Raws, I mean, best Raws, I mean, obviously the one where they brought back the brand split in 2016, the one right after Battleground. I thought that was a great show. Any Raw after WrestleMania in the last five or six years has been really, really good. Um, again, worst Raws, just any of those Raws from really the last three years. Take your pick, and you're not wrong. But best Raws, really any post-WrestleMania Raw... And in recent years, of all time, like the January 4th, 1999 episode where Mick Foley won the WWE title, that will obviously be fondly remembered forever, and it's been 20 years since it happened. Um, that's all I can really think of right now. I know there's other historically significant shows and other really, really good shows, but none that I can think of. Like, also the anniversary shows, obviously, like the 15th anniversary of Raw, Raw 1000, were both great shows. And I hope the 25th anniversary of Raw is equally amazing. Because I'll be there especially. So I'm hoping it's going to be good. And it won't be a disappointment like the 25th anniversary of Raw episode was uh, five years ago. At Brad Burdar from Twitter. I cannot express how excited I am to hear the return of my favorite tag team in the world. And my fellow Western Australians, TM61. The team has a lot of potential as both guys have charisma and are great wrestlers. As I believe Thorne has proven himself to be one of the very best in the world with some amazing uh, matches that he had in the Japanese promotion Noah. However, with the NXT Tag Team Division thriving at the moment, will they struggle to make it to the top of the division? Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll see. I think the cream rises to the top, especially in NXT. And if the guys are that good, I mean, for the most part, like, look at Solomon Crow, he went nowhere. But, I mean, I think if you look at these guys and they do have charisma, and I mean, I've seen it. Obviously, you know what they're capable of. The world really has not seen much of TM61. They, their run in 2016 was not that long before one of them got hurt, and they had to take time off for like a year. Um, but I think they are really, really good. As they call it more teams, too, I know right now we have the Street Profits. You got Heavy Machinery, the Undisputed Era, the Authors of Pain, Sanity. I think the Authors of Pain are absolutely main roster bound in the very near future, um, probably after the Rumble, I'd imagine. 
And then Sanity, I could also see going up to the main roster at some point between now and WrestleMania, or after WrestleMania. So with those two teams gone, you can kind of fill in that slot with um, TM61. So yeah, I would go Team 6-1 as a top team in the division. As you say, they're really, really good. They got great charisma. We have really only seen them scratch the surface in terms of what they're capable of. Um, but I do have faith they can be a top tag team in the division if they're pushed properly. And it's NXT, so I feel like they will. All the tag teams that have always been really, really good. I've never seen a, like a tag team that was great in NXT. Never really rise to the top. Again, someone cast never won the tag titles, but they were always a top tag team in that division, so... I guess we'll see, but I do have faith that they will be a uh, you know set of tag team champions. They will be champions before long. Hey, maybe they're the ones to beat um, Undisputed Era, if not Street Profits, at some point in 2018. I would be all for that. Top five favorite Pixar movies. Uh, Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., Bugs Life, and uh, Toy Story 2 and Toy Story 3. Um, I love the Toy Story movies. A lot of them, all three were fantastic, so I can't vote against any one of those installments, but honorable mentions, Incredibles, and Finding Nemo. I mean, there's a lot of, there's some Pixar movies I don't really care too much for. I didn't see Brave. Cars I like, never saw Cars 2 or 3. Um, what are the other ones? I mean, the more recent sequels, like Finding Dory and Monsters University, I thought were also great, but my favorites are Toy Story 1, 2, and 3, uh, Monsters, Inc., and Bugs Life. Bugs Life is low-key hilarious. Even 20 years later, that movie is amazingly hilarious. People got to rewatch that in the uh, in the modern day. Next question, also from Brad, he's got two more questions here before we wrap it up. Um, nothing against Titus Worldwide, but wouldn't have made it wouldn't have made it uh, wouldn't have made excuse me much more sense to have the revival pick up that victory over the bar on Raw. Yes, it would have. I I was thinking that. A lot of people are thinking that. Obviously, you were as well. Um, I have no idea why they did not give that win to the Revival. If they don't put Titus Worldwide in that tag team title match at the pay-per-view, then what the fuck was the point, <laughs> you know? Now, maybe they'll get their win back next week on Raw. This is merely their way of killing time. You know what? That's fine. But it's like, why ruin the, any momentum these guys had, that Sheamus and Cesaro had, by having them lose to a tag team that has not won a match since Methuselah was alive, you know? It's like, it's ridiculous. And I like Apollo Crews, but this tag team ain't going anywhere. Anywhere. So, yeah, the Revival just came back like three weeks ago. We have not seen them since on TV, which is fucking ridiculous given how good they are. So I remember reading recently that, oh, the company has no plans for them. It's like, dude, you push Titus Worldwide over the Revival? Give me a break. So, yeah, I hope the Revival resurfaces soon and they beat Titus Worldwide and they get themselves in the tag team title picture before long. And the final question, also from Brad. A few weeks ago, I remember you talked about how aside from Elias and a few others, most NXT superstars are much worse off when they make it to the main roster. Do you think you could do one of your random video blogs in the future on a list of the biggest NXT call-ups to the main roster? Um, yeah, that's actually a great idea. I know like there's been articles about it about it in the past, but I've never done a video blog about it, so um, that would be a great topic. Maybe not any time in the, in the like next few weeks, like you said, in the future. Um, if you're talking about, like, the best call-ups, I could do the best and worst if you wanted me to. Um, I mean, there's a lot to choose from. I mean, there's been a lot of call-ups in the last six years, uh, since NXT kind of was revamped into what it is today. But yeah, like, this week, just a quick preview. This week on the random video blog, I already filmed it, but uh, I'm doing my review of the Saint Mick book, Mick Foley's latest autobiography on Santa Claus, on, uh, himself as Santa, so... I'll be reviewing that book on Friday in the random video blog. The week after that, I'll be doing like my top five favorite raw moments, either that I was in attendance for or just my favorite raw moments in general that I've been a fan for. I'll be doing that ahead of Raw's uh, 25th anniversary in two weeks. And then the week after that, before the Royal Rumble, I think I'll be doing like five people. I would love to see a surprise entrance in the Royal Rumble match um, coming up in 2018 because I'll be there. So uh, that about does it for this week's edition of Hashtag Ask GSM, the episode two, one, or 215, I almost said 115, it's going back 100 episodes here, episode 215, January 10th, 2018, appreciate the support, and also for bearing with me too, uh, my voice has been kind of, actually it's been decent the last few days, but I've had like a, a sore throat for the past two days, and only today it's only been giving me issues, so for whatever reason it just has not been holding up today, so I apologize if the early portions of this video are not too great or the whole thing but anyway guys if you want to send in a question 
I would very much appreciate it to answer right here on the show next week or on a future episode. Be sure to tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, be sure to drop a comment on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So all that being said, folks, be sure to like this video. Drop the comment, like I said, with your thoughts in the video, a question, whatever. Subscribe and also share the video. All that stuff means the world. So again, guys, have an awesome rest of your week. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Royal Rumble season. As I mentioned, I will be at the 25th anniversary of Raw and the Royal Rumble, so we got a pretty big week coming up. And also, real quick, too, for those asking, I will have something up about the Royal Rumble game, the 6th annual Royal Rumble game from uh, Next Air Wrestling and myself and WrestleRant Radio, whatever, uh, for 2018 in the very near future, like in the next few days. Because uh, we're going to do something with that probably next week, because like I mentioned the week after that, the go-home week before the Rumble is going to be busy because I'll be at Raw and a few other things are going on. So I'll probably be uh, doing the Royal Rumble game stuff, uh, the Royal Rumble game stuff like GSM trivia, where you guys can win a spot, get to pick your spot ahead of time, and also do the um, you know the signups for the spots likely next week, around this time next week. So stay tuned for that on uh, uh, more information on that on the Twitter machine and all the other social media sites in the description box down below. That being said, folks, have an awesome rest of your week. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.